Well, two weeks ago, when we had our last class, so I want to go ahead and, and quickly remind you of where we are because I think that's so important that you, at least you have to understand how I see the letter, the thought flow in it, and then you can weigh whether you think I'm on track. So you have to understand. So I want you to keep in mind how I understand what's going on. In chapter 1, verse 5, John says that the message the apostles heard from Jesus and what they through John proclaimed to John's readers, he says that that message is that God is light and in him there's no darkness at all. And then he lays out the ethical implications of that message in chapter 1, verses 6 through 10. Christians must walk in the light. They must live in submission to God's will and at the same time must not deny their sin but must confess it. Those who are walking in the light have an ongoing cleansing of their sin through the blood of Jesus. And then in chapter 2, verses 1 and 2, he clarifies that he has no intention of encouraging sin by speaking so freely about the magnificence of God's grace in Christ. But they need to be assured, and of course we need to be assured. But he says to them, they need to be assured that their sins will be forgiven. And the reason their sins will be forgiven is that those of genuine faith in Christ, those who are walking in the light, are represented before God by the blood of Christ's atonement. No one he represents is condemned. He bats a thousand. If he's representing you before the Father through his blood, well, then you're assured and you're at peace that your sins are forgiven. In chapter 2, verses 3 through 6, he repeats the ethical point, the need to live in submission to the will of God, but he does so now as a condition of assurance. So he repeats that point, this time as a condition of assurance. Those who live lives of faith, however imperfectly, but those who live lives of faith can be assured their faith is genuine and thus can be assured of their relationship with God. And then in chapter 2, verses 7 to 11, he speaks of an old and new commandment. There's this old and new commandment referring to the commandment to love. It was old in the sense it had been given to them originally. It had been given to them when they first had the gospel preached to them. And yet it was new in the sense that Jesus had qualitatively transformed the Old Testament commandment to love, and he had done so by giving that commandment a broader character and a radically sacrificial character. And so it was new with Christ, and it was old in that it was a part of the original message that had been preached to him. Now that's where we were when we ended two weeks ago. Let me reread 2, 7 through 11. And I'll pick back up there. He says, Beloved, I'm not writing a new commandment to you, but an old commandment that you've had from the beginning. The old commandment is the word that you have heard. Yet I am writing a new commandment, which is true in him and in you, because the darkness is passing away and the true light already is shining. The one who claims to be in the light while hating his brother is still in the darkness. The one who loves his brother abides in the light, and in it there is no cause for stumbling. But the one who hates his brother is in the darkness, walks in the darkness, and does not know where he is going because the darkness has blinded his eyes. He says in verse, find the right button. He says in verse 9 that the false teacher, see, the, the, the one who claims to be in the light while hating his brother is still in the darkness. And as I said two weeks ago, the false teachers apparently didn't believe that their unbrotherly treatment of the orthodox, their failure to love the orthodox, the faithful community, and that failure to love is implied, you see in chapter 3, verses 11 to 17, and in chapter 4, verse 20 to 21, they apparently didn't believe that that response and that unbrotherly treatment of the orthodox was a sin. As far as they were concerned, it didn't constitute walking in the darkness. And John here specifically rejects that view. Those who hate fellow believers is how John puts it, meaning those who don't love them. John says they are in the darkness, and according to chapter 1, verse 6, they're lying about having fellowship with God. 
Now, John assumes, I said this two weeks ago, he assumes that those, that if a person doesn't love his brother or sister, he hates them. See, there's no neutral territory. I, Howard Marshall, he says, his concept of love is caring for the needs of others, even to the point of self-sacrifice. If I'm unwilling to do that for someone in need, I love myself more than him. I'm not merely being neutral, but actually am hating him. And you have to see, I, I think it's helpful to recognize that John's focus on loving, on loving brothers, it's dictated by the circumstances of the letter. He's dealing with the fact that the false teachers were not loving the Orthodox. They were not loving his faithful community. They had seceded from them. They had walked away from them and are apparently treating them in an unbrotherly fashion. So he's dealing with that fact and he's using that fact to expose the false teachers. He's trying to protect the Orthodox. So he wants them to recognize that those who don't love you are not of the truth. That's these people. That's these false teachers. So he wants to, he's using that to help expose them. Then he says in verse 10, he says there, the one who loves his brother abides in the light, and in it there is no cause for stumbling. He states the opposite truth now. He gives the other side of the coin. The one who loves fellow believers, unlike the false teachers, you see, that person is in the light. And in the light, in it, some translations like the English Standard just go ahead and say in the light. But it's a pronoun. It's it. It's it. It could be him, but I think it's it. it, it meaning in the light. In it, there are no pitfalls. There are no traps. There's nothing in the light. One who is walking in the light, one who's living in submission to God, however imperfectly, okay? I understand that. But one who's living this way, there are, in the light, there are no pitfalls. There's no cause for stumbling. There's nothing to cause one to fall short of the blessings given by God in Christ. I mean, according to chapter 1, verse 7, the blood of Christ continually cleanses those who are in the light. Right? So in it, in the light, there are no pitfalls, no stumbling blocks, no holes, no cliff edges. There's nothing in the light to cause one to stumble because in the light, in this life of submission, this life of genuine faith, in the light, there's no cause for stumbling. In the light, the blood of Jesus continually cleanses us. So this is what he's saying. Now, I said it, the, the phrase, in it, it could be in him, because you can't tell the pronoun can be either masculine or neuter. But if it's in him, then it means, well, in that person, in the person who's walking in the light, there's nothing in him that would cause him to stumble or cause another person to stumble, would distract them or pull them away. But I think it's in it. I think it means in the light. Then he says in verse 11, he says, The one who hates his brothers in the darkness walks in the darkness and does not know where he's going because the darkness has blinded his eyes. He repeats the claim of verse 9. But he does that. Now he adds this notion of walking in darkness. So he repeats the claim but adds walking in darkness and he does that because of the reference that he just made to the absence of pitfalls or stumbling blocks in the preceding verse. You see, as there are no pitfalls, there are no stumbling blocks in the light, there are no threats to one's security, one who is in the light, well, one who walks in darkness does so at one's peril. You see, walking in darkness, you're doing that at your peril. Danger lurks with each step because you can't see. See, as you're walking in darkness, you don't know where the next, you know, that, you know, that, that last step was a doozy. You know that line? You don't know if there's a pit, the edge of the cliff, the edge of the trail. You have no idea. So one in darkness walks at one's peril. And John adds the idea that those in darkness are blind and therefore they don't know the way to go. And see, that's aimed at the false teachers. That's aimed at the false teachers who, what are they claiming? They're claiming the role of spiritual guides. If you followed how I'm, you know, understand what's going on. Here they are, they're telling the orthodox, they're telling the faithful, 
you've really missed the boat, and we have transcended that so much so that we've seceded from you. We, we're the real enlightened people, so much so that they're making them concerned about their own faithfulness. They're presenting themselves as spiritual guides. They've evolved beyond the orthodoxy, and they're apparently they're claiming that they've got the real, true, deep insight. Well, according to John... Anybody who follows these teachers is what? He's following a blind guide, echoing Jesus. You see, they're in the darkness. They don't see there's peril there, and they can't see where they're going. So, by the way, if you follow them, you are following a blind guide. So don't do it. Don't go off and don't be persuaded by them. Then in chapter 2, verses 12 to 17, he gives an assurance of salvation and a warning. In 2.12 to 17, he gives an assurance of salvation and a warning. And the assurance of their salvation, he gives that in, in two addresses. Verses 12 and 13 is the first address, and then verse 14 is the second address, and then he's going to issue a warning in 15 through 17. So assurance in two addresses and then a warning. And the first address is in 2.12 and 13, he says, I write to you, little children, that to you the sins have been forgiven on account of his name. I write to you, fathers, that you have known the one who is from the beginning. I write to you, young men, that you have overcome the evil one. Now, John addresses his readers. He addresses the community to which he is writing in terms of three groups. He speaks of the little children. He speaks of the fathers, and he speaks of the young men. So these are the three groups. Now, from the order, it seems likely that little children expresses the whole. Little children is the entire group of faithful Christians to whom John is writing. And then fathers and young men are two subdivisions of that group, old and young, that cover the whole group. Most modern commentators understand it that way. Little children, all of them, and then the totality of that group is subdivided into two groups, the old and the young. And John, elsewhere in the letter, he addresses all of the readers as children or little children, so which kind of confirms that notion. You can see that in 2.1, 2.18, 2.28, 3.7, 3.18, 4.4, 5.21, 5, 5.22, 5, 5, so this is not at all unusual. So I think that's what's going on that he addresses them collectively as children, then he subdivides them into young and old, that subdivision capturing the totality of the group. Now, there's a question. One of the big exegetical questions is, how do you understand this conjunction, uh, this Greek conjunction? Does it mean, where he says here, I write to you little children, does it mean because? The word that's used can mean because, or it can mean that. And so there's a question, see, and you can only tell contextually what does it mean. Which of those uses fits better contextually? Now, you'll find translations that'll say, I write to you because. I write to you because. So the question is, does that Greek word, that Greek conjunction, does it explain why John is writing? Is that what he's doing? Is he saying, I write to you because, I write to you because, I write, or does it explain what he's writing to them? I write to you that, I write to you that, okay? That's the, that's the question and that's the issue. Now, the latter seems to me to be more consistent with the conclusion that John's audience is demoralized or unsure of their status because of the false teachers. That's the view of Raymond Brown, Colin Cruz, and many other people. I think that's on the right track. I think what you have here is their sense of assurance has been disturbed by the false teachers claiming that they have the real insight. You need to be worried because we have transcended and we are the real insightful people. You're not with us and you need to be worried about your standing before God. And John is trying to assure them these people are nonsense. What they're saying to you is complete nonsense. He's writing to assure his children that their sins are forgiven, that 
they know the Father. That's how I understand that. Now, I think he addresses all of his readers in two ways. Okay, I think he's talking to all of them, but he addresses them in two ways. First, with this collective term, little children. And then I think he speaks to all of them by addressing the two, the two groups that are understood to comprise the whole. Old and young. As I. Howard Marshall notes, there was no category of middle-aged in the language of the New Testament. You're either young or old. So I think he's addressing the whole group. I think he's doing that in two ways. He first speaks of them collectively as the little children, and then he speaks of them as the two groups that comprise the whole. That subdivision, I think, is just, I think it's a rhetorical device. A rhetorical device where John emphasizes their security by expressing it in different words. Let me give you an illustration of how I understand this, what I think is going on. It's as if General Eisenhower wrote to the soldiers who had stormed the beaches of Normandy, and he said, I say to you men that you honored your country. I say to you officers that you fought bravely. I say to you enlisted men that you won the victory. Now, I don't think anybody would think that when Eisenhower wrote that, that he would be saying, well, enlisted men, you didn't fight bravely. Only the officers did. And officers, you didn't win the victory. Only the enlisted men did. I think everybody would understand that he spoke first of the men, then he subdivided that for rhetorical purposes to strengthen the point that he was making that you guys did a knockout job. That's how I read this. Okay, I think he first speaks collectively, then he speaks for rhetorical purposes to the young and old, but the whole point is to assure them of their position with God in light of the doubt that has been stirred up by the false teachers. John says to all of them that their sins have been forgiven on account of Jesus Christ. He's assuring them of that. He says to the older men that they've known Jesus Christ, the one on whose account sins are forgiven. He's trying to reassure them. He wants them to know that. The one who's from the beginning is best understood as a reference to Jesus. So this is what he's saying. He says, look, your sins have been forgiven on account of Christ. Older men, they've known Jesus Christ, the one on whose account Sins are forgiven. He says to the young men that they've overcome the evil one. Meaning that they've overcome his agenda of death through their relationship with Jesus. So he's letting them know that these attempts to disturb you are bogus. And people need to know that. People need to be confident in their standing with God. That is one of the quickest ways into somebody is you try to pull them apart from their sense of security with God. And now that I've got them worried about it, now I have their ear. And I can start pitching my stuff to them. You see, but as long as they're confident that they're secure, it's more difficult to do that. We get the second address. So that's the first address. I think he's, he's giving them assurance. He does it through two addresses. The second address is verse 14. I write to you children that you have known the Father. I write to you, fathers, that you have known the one who is from the beginning. I write to you, young men, that you are strong and the word of God abides in you and you have overcome the evil one. Now, John, here he varies the statement to the children. He varies that statement and he repeats the statements to the fathers and the young men with an addition regarding the young men. And it seems to me he's, he's going out of his way to emphasize their status. That's how I take this. He's going out of his way to emphasize their status. He wants no question with them that they're right with God. He wants to leave no room for that pick of the false teachers to get in and start prying and working on them. So he's trying to reassure them that way. As he says in chapter 5, verse 13... He wants the readers to know that they have eternal life. To know. A faithful Christian, a person who's living for Christ imperfectly, I know. But a person who's living for Christ needs to be at peace and needs to be assured and needs to know that they're right with God and are saved and have, have eternal life. That's peace. 
That's what God wants. He doesn't want people who are spiritual neurotics who are going, I say, I say, can I, can I? That's just nonsense, and that's, you're just a sitting duck for the enemy. And so he doesn't want that. He says, he says to all of them, referred now simply as children instead of little children, but he does that throughout. So he says to all of them that they've known the Father, which relationship is through Jesus Christ. So he tells them all they've known the Father. He again says to the fathers that they've known Jesus Christ the one through whom one receives a relationship with the Father. And he again says to the young men that they've overcome the evil one. He says all that, but he adds that the young men have done so because they're strong. And they're strong, why? Because the word of God abides or remains in them. They allowed the message they allowed that message that is proclaimed by and embodied in Jesus Christ. They allowed that message, that message that they heard from the beginning in chapter 2, verse 24. They allowed that message to remain in them despite the false teacher's efforts to pry it from them. You see, they allowed that original authentic message to remain in them and therefore they maintained their relationship with Christ and therefore overcame the evil one's agenda of death. So this is what I think John is saying to them. And it's interesting, people often point out that in the, these two statements of assurance, these two addresses, that there's a switch in tenses between the verb when he says, I, I have right present and I wrote, you could translate if you wanted to, but I don't translate it that way because most scholars rec recognize that it's just a stylistic variation with no substantive difference, and that's how I see it. And that wouldn't be abnormal. But I just point that out just for your interest. So now, so he assures them, remember, 12, in, in chapter 2, 12 to 17, he gives them this, this, this assurance of their, and then he issues a warning. So you get the assurance in verses 12 to 14, and then in 15 to 17, he warns them. He says, do not love the world or the things in the world. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the desire of the flesh, the desire of the eyes, and the pride in possessions is not from the Father, but is from the world. And the world is passing away. Also, it's desire. But the one who does the will of God lives forever. So we have the command. The command in verse 15, do not love the world or the things in the world. Do not love the world or the things in the world. Now, this is particularly appropriate in view of the fact the false teachers are what? They're of the world. That's what he says in chapter 4, verse 5. They are of the world. So what are they trying to do? The effect of their pulling on them is calling them to love the world. And so he says, do not love the world. And world here, it doesn't, just, it doesn't mean material earth or the inhabitants of it. The world, that word's used in, in various senses. And in John, you see it, and as Jesus uses it in the Gospel of John, it refers to Satan as what? The prince of this world. Okay, the word, the word often signifies mankind in organized rebellion to God. World in that sense. You see, world in God-opposing sphere. God-opposing attitudes. That sense of world. Not just talking about physical earth or the inhabitants. There's more of the sense of opposition to God. And so he's telling them not to love the world. That's why I said Jesus, Jesus says it's in that sense that Jesus in the Gospel of John he refers to Satan as the prince of this world or prince of the world. And John says in 1 John chapter 5, verse 19, that the whole world lies in the power of the evil one. Well, world in what sense? This whole world that has cast its lot in opposition to God. You see, in that hostile sense, in that oppositional sense, not simply in a material sense. And so that, that's the idea Cruz says Colin Cruz, he says, there can be no doubt that in the present context, world means worldly attitudes or values that are opposed to God. 
And I think that's important to grasp that. He says, do not love the world or the things in the world. Now, things in the world, this is something, this refers to specific things that embody those values and those attitudes that are opposed to God. It is a particularization of the world. Don't love the world, this general sense of opposition and hostility, this fear, don't love that. And don't love the specific things in the world that are manifestations of that. So don't don't love that. And the word love, it has a different shade of meaning here than it did in chapter 2, verse 10. Right there, it signifies outgoing care. Right? I mean, it signifies compassion. It's a concern for the benefit of the person loved. It's what we typically mean when we say love. But there's a different sense of love. Here it's the, thought, the thoughts of the pleasure the person hopes to get from the object of his love. The thought is of appetite and desire. You see, there's a little different nuance here when he tells them don't love the world. John 3.19 speaks of people's love for darkness. Okay, well, it, it doesn't have the same sense. We're talking about love one another and sacrificial commitment to somebody else's welfare. It has this idea of, of you know, pleasure, what one hopes to get, appetites, and this kind of thing. You remember Demas, he abandoned Paul in 2 Timothy 4.10. Why? Because he loved this present age or loved the world. It's that sense. You see that sense. So the exhortation, what he's saying there when he tells them, do not love the world or the things in the world, the exhortation is that we are not to long for or desire that which is opposed to God. We're not to long for or desire that which is opposed to God. Gary Burge in his commentary, he says, Christians are to avoid an infatuation with worldly godlessness with the realm of darkness that brings base pleasures. And you say, how could people ever do it? Look around. Look, how, how could people ever have an infatuation with worldly godlessness? Do we not see people wearing the name Jesus claiming it is okay for guys and gals who aren't married to live together and sleep together? Don't they say that? All right. Well, see, you see the idea. It's not like, well, and you see in this context where if I'm tracking correctly the error of these false teachers, that part of it was they thought that God didn't care how one conducted oneself in this body, all they cared about was the enlightenment of the spirit and the ultimate escape. So how you actually lived, God didn't care about. Well, that would be a siren song to people to feed the flesh, right? If I can sit here and simply say, listen, you live however you want. God, here's, here's my deeper gospel. Yeah, these people over here, they're okay. But, you know, they're kind of stuck down in this worldly, you know, they, they have this low vision. They're not very spiritual. They're not very released. They're like children. And where, what I'm offering, the gospel, the real deep, insightful gospel, is that God doesn't care how you live. Okay? Well, you, what, what, what would that feed? You see, so he's commanding them here. And I think birds get, Christians are to avoid an infatuation with worldly godlessness. We have to be alert to that. We are to avoid that, that idea that that's really the right view. That's the deep view. That's the way to go. We have to knock that off and with this realm of darkness with which brings base pleasures. Now, he gives reasons for that. Well, why are we not to love the world? He gives reason, and the first reason he gives is that love for the world is incompatible with love for the Father. You see, it's, it's incompatible. He says, if anyone loves the world... The love of the Father is not in him. If anyone loves the world, the love of the Father is not in him. For all that is in the world, the desire of the flesh, the desire of the eyes, and the pride in possessions is not from the Father, but it's from the world. You see, so if we are engrossed in the outlook and the pursuits of the world, this sphere that is in opposition to God, it is obvious to John that we don't love the Father. James chapter 4, verse 4 says the same thing, right? He says, friendship with the world is what? Hatred toward God. Ooh, that sounds very binary indeed. <laughs> That's how he looks at it. Friendship with the world is hatred toward God. In Matthew 6, 24, Jesus says that no one can serve two masters. 
And if we can't serve God and money, neither can we love the Father in the world. That's what he's talking about. And verse 16 elaborates on why love for the world is incompatible with love for God. Because the things of the world are not from God. They are an opposition camp. They're, they are in opposition to God. There are two opposing camps. There is the world, in the sense we're talking about. There is the world, which is this mankind in organized hostility and opposition to God. There is this realm, and there's God. So those are the two choices, and one cannot love the Father while loving that which is opposed to Him. How does that make any sense? That I love the Father, but I love His enemy. I love who's trying to disrupt His work. I love who's trying to undermine everything He's doing. I love who's trying to steal those He wants to save. Well, you can't. You see, you can't. And uh, John's not the only one to say that. He's not the only one, and he gives examples of things in the world. Examples of things, the de desire of the flesh. Now, that may refer to cravings for sensual pleasure. That may be the meaning, or it may refer to a more general pursuit of self-centered independence from God, a kind of selfish human desire, where I want to be on the throne and I want to run my life. In other words, it could be more general. Like when we think of desire of the flesh, we think of perhaps base sexual desires. That could be it. Or it could be this more generalized pursuit of self-centered independence from God. And he speaks of desire of the eyes. And the basic thought there is probably of greed and an improper desire for things that are aroused by seeing them. You know, man, did you see that dude's car? You see that boat? You see this, you see that, you see that woman, you see. You see, this idea of these things are, you know, triggered. And it's probably referring to that idea, you know, of, of improper desire for things that are aroused by seeing them. Then he speaks of pride in possessions. And I think here the idea is, is about boasting and pretentiousness. Pride in possessions. He's trying to impress people by one's external situation. This is how people are. We want other people to look at us like we're something. Whether we are going to lag in front of them uh, what we've accumulated in terms of degrees or in terms of material things or whatever it is. What do you think trophy wife means? Well, that captures the idea. What are you doing? I'm trying to lag this person out there so you'll think that I'm really something. Okay, well, if a person's really wealthy, you know, I got this big hot car and I got this big, big house. Why? I want people to think something of me. It's a manifestation of a, of a pride that is not right. So this is a, what I think is, is there. And it may be, see, that the first idea, this idea of the desire of the flesh, it might be that that's an inclusive concept that then, that then is filled out by the other two, by desire of the eyes and pride in possessions. See, selfish human desire is stimulated by what the eye sees, and then that expresses itself in outward show. You see, so I, I, I'm stimulated, and then I want you to think something of me. And so he's warning them about that. This stuff is subtle. You see, this perception of the world is subtle. And he wants them to recognize that. Now, clearly, we all need possessions. You see, and it cannot be wrong to want and to take pleasure in what God has provided for our needs. That's not what John is saying. What he's condemning is a warped desire for things, a boasting in possessions, an attitude that allows those things to cut one off from one's fellow human beings. It simply becomes a tool by which I can separate myself from you and have you exalt me. This is what he's thinking about. It fuels that and it fuels this false belief of self-sufficiency. That's what he's talking about. See this idea, I, me, I'm something. You need to exalt me. You need to recognize that I'm better than you. Uh, this is deep, deep in people. And so he's putting his finger on that. 
See, in these types of things, they want they characterize the sphere of rebellion to God. They characterize the world. These kinds of things that he's talking about. And then the second reason he gives for not loving the world is that, he, is that the world is doomed. <laughs> it's doomed. He says, and the world is passing away in the desire of it, but the one who does the will of God lives forever. So this sphere that God is tolerating presently, this realm of opposition to him is doomed. It's toast. You see, the world as both the origin and the goal of wrong desire is passing away, and it is a loser's move to hook one's wagon to that which is expiring. Why would you do that? Why would you go and cast your lot with what is going down the commode? That's, that's, not a, that's a loser's move to do that. And so he tells them here that this world is doomed. Those who opt for the world, who choose to align themselves with this, in this sphere and put themselves with worldliness in this sphere of opposition and rebellion to God, those who opt for that will suffer the world's fate. They will suffer the world's fate, whereas those who opt for God, described as those who what? Do the will of God. Well, does that mean you've got to live perfectly? I have no hair left to pull out. Okay, I've said this many times. I hope, I hope when I say this you get the idea of direction, submission, genuineness. Those who, who love God, those who do His will, those who make that choice, who opt for God, well, they'll receive God's gift of eternal life. So he sits here and don't love the world. Why? The world's going. But why? Those who love God... They have an eternal life. So he explains to them why. Here's what Colin Cruz says. Because of all that has been set in motion by God through the coming of Jesus Christ, the world is passing away and its days are numbered. This is the invasion of the kingdom that Jesus in his life and his ministry and his death and his resurrection and his ascension, that Jesus is the one who ushered in the kingdom of God. This not yet being pulled into the now. This is a different situation. Jesus' coming has changed the state of reality. He has inaugurated this kingdom. And that's what he's talking about. He says, all that is antithetical to God and his grace is passing away. It's a done deal. The kingdom has been planted. It's, it's, it's on the way out. Now, it won't finally be stripped out until the consummation at the Lord's second coming. But he says here, it's passing away. It is doomed. There is no future in worldliness. While the author says that the world and its desires pass away, he adds, but the man who does the will of God lives, literally remains forever. There will come a time when the world which is passing away will have passed away. That's the consummation. See, the world, it's in process of passing away. Is that the second bell or first? See, it's in process of passing away. There's going to come a time when it will have passed away. But it's already passing away. Why? Because Christ has brought the kingdom. And so he says here, there will come a time when the world which is passing away will have passed away, but those who do the will of God will not have passed away with it, for they will remain forever. And so he says, so why would you opt for loving the world? Why would you make that choice of aligning yourself with those who oppose God, with the values and those things that are against God? Why would you do that? He's explaining it to them. And then in 18 to 25, we're not going to get very far on this because I heard that bell. All right. He says in 18 to 25, we, we, this is the warning against the false teachers and in 18 and 19, he, he identifies the false teachers as the antichrists, plural, of the last hour. He says in 2, 18 and 19, Children, it is the last hour, and as you have heard that antichrist, singular, is coming, even now, many antichrists have come, from which we know that it is the last hour. They went out from us, but they were not of us, 
For if they were of us, they would have remained with us. But this happened that they might be exposed. For all of them are not of us, meaning none of them are of us. The complete group, all 100% are not of us. So the way we'd probably say that more idiomatically in English is we would say none of them are of us, and I suspect your translations do that. I just sometimes like to keep things very wooden so it reminds me where the issues are. Okay, so he says here, and for, for all of them, meaning none of them, are of us. Now, John's readers had heard that Antichrist was coming prior to the consummation of the kingdom of God at the Lord's second coming. When he returns, when the final eternal state would be established, John's readers had heard that. It's not something new. It was apostolic teaching that prior to the consummation, Antichrist would come. And you see that in 2 Thessalonians chapter 2, verses 1 to 12, where Paul speaks of the future coming of a man of lawlessness. That's how Paul refers to him, the final opponent of God, whom Jesus will overthrow and destroy at his second coming. Now, with many commentators and theologians, I believe that's the same figure referred to in Revelation chapter 13 as the beast out of the sea. Okay, you can disagree with that. I'm just telling you how I see it. You know how I work. I tell you how I see it. You take it, weigh it, say, I think he's all wet. Throw that out. Okay, but I present to you how I understand things for your weighing. But, I would, but I'm not alone in that. I think that's the same person who's referred to there. He's a Satan-inspired ruler of a powerful, worldwide, and violently anti-Christian empire who draws people from God through deception. Now, I'm convinced that this character is coming before Jesus returns. Okay, so this is, I think that when he speaks here, John says, see, so they had heard about that. Many people in the church never heard about it. But they had heard about it. He just assumes it and tells them. He says, you know, you've heard that Antichrist is coming. But he says, even now, let me tell you, that many antichrists, before the coming of the antichrist about whom you heard, before that climactic opponent of God, he says, I'm telling you that even now, many antichrists, plural, have come. And John is referring, of course, to the false teachers. He's referring to the false teachers. They are antichrists in the sense they share the spirit of antichrist. They are of one piece with Antichrist. As you see in John 4, 3, he says, Every spirit that does not confess Jesus is not of God. Indeed, this is the spirit of the Antichrist. Well, who are these? what are these people confessing? Jesus, they're denying Jesus is the Christ. They're denying that he's the one, the actual incarnation of God. Well, who's that? That's an opponent. Anti. They are expressing the spirit of of antichrist even then they are opponents of god they are antichrist in that sense that they share the spirit of antichrist the spirit that opposes god and his christ and this is evident from their denial of jesus as the christ as you see in chapter 2 verse 22 and as you see in second john verse 7 so this is he, he's ident- i heard that bell he's identifying these people now as antichrists They are threatening that community with their false Christology, also with their false ethics. But they are denying who Jesus is, and in that they are manifesting and expressing the spirit of the Antichrist. (coughs) Now, this this is a theological, this last hour, I'll talk about next week, Lord willing. But this last hour, it's a theological category, not a chronological one. It's one that's marked by this presence of these false teachers manifesting the spirit of Antichrist. Okay, I'm through. Thanks.